host James Carville in the wake of Election Day last week, blaming Democrats' wokeness as the reason for their losses across the board and starting a conversation, a very, very vibrant one, about how exactly Democrats have lost some of the good things they had going for them. As Congressman Conley said earlier in this program, 13-point swing since one year ago. Seemingly as a reaction to part of that conversation, our friend Matt Dowd chimed in yesterday on Twitter, tweeting this, quote, as they sat in church today, I was thinking, if Jesus were here today, he would be accused of being woke. How about we just say it is human decency to treat all with respect and dignity, and that it is constitutional to say all men and women are equal. Joining us now on set is my longtime friend, Matt Dowd. He was chief strategist to George W. Bush's re-election campaign. He's now a Democratic candidate for Texas Lieutenant Governor. He's the author of the new book, Revelations on the River. We'll get to the book in a second. I want to I want to try to nail you down on where you come down on I think this is probably not a very helpful debate to have about wokeness, but I wonder I wonder what you think. Well, first, I don't ever think it's a really good thing to, for old white guys to use the term woke, right, to, to, in, and frame the reference of that. To me, this is like, it's, it's another thing like critical race theory, right? Like people say this word and it's taken on a pejorative, but it doesn't, there's like, nobody knows what it means that's accusing other people of it. And as I said in my uh, tweet, and I've tried to say, how about we just like treat everybody with decency and respect and a common sense of that, that they belong here? Um, and obviously uh, that all men and women are created equal. That's what we need to get to. The only people that are, this is, seems to be a fire about is again in their sort of right wing infrastructure ecosystem here in there. But Democrats need to get back to just using the common values that every American connects to. And that's the conversation we need to have in the course of this. I don't think Terry McAuliffe lost Virginia because of the woke culture in all of this. He probably, in my view, lost more because he talked about Donald Trump too much. And I think that's what the problem with the voters have right now is they want to have this battle on election. In their mind, Donald Trump is yesterday, even though we all know he sort of surfaces in this. But they want to know your candidacy versus the other person. What's the difference and what are you going to do in my life? Quit talking about Donald Trump. So you don't think that education, which was wrapped up in a whole bunch of things, it wasn't just this campaign pledge from Glenn Youngkin to ban critical race theory, which isn't taught in Virginia public schools, but it meant something to Virginia voters. I mean, I hear you, and I, I said that, and the right went berserk. So critical race theory isn't taught in schools. It's an attack that connotes something that isn't real. It's real to those voters who swung in a huge way in the suburbs and ran up margins for Glenn Youngkin in rural Virginia. Well, here's, this is the problem that I want to, is in my candidacy, want to try to help Democrats in this. And I said this during the 2004 campaign, anytime the other side is using your term, you're winning in, a, in the course of a race. So if they're using your terminology, you win, you're winning in this race. The problem to me that happened with, with Terry McAuliffe is he made that, in my view, mistake when he said parents shouldn't be involved yeah. in education. There's a way to say that. There is a way to say that, you know, teachers should be able to teach and history should be able to be provided in schools and we should teach science and all that. And of course, parents should be involved in the education of their own children. There's a way to talk about that. But again, every time the Democrats try to get in a debate, factual as it is, and they're using Republicans' terms, Republicans are winning when they use, when the other side uses their terms. So what do you think the best strategy is for Democrats to try to sort of defy all that history of a president's party suffering in midterm elections a year from now? So I think I think part of it is, is there's the voters more and more are distinguished between, between what the how they view somebody nationally. So I think people can dislike Joe Biden and not like something about him and vote for the Democrats. And we see it already in generic polling. And Joe Biden's numbers are underwater, but Democrats still have an advantage on generic polling. You saw it in, in Virginia with Donald Trump. People dislike Donald Trump, but they voted for Glenn Youngkin in the course of this. I think the bigger thing is Democrats have to quit arguing about policies. Yeah. Policies are important and issues are important, but voters vote on values. And Republicans have understood that for far longer in a far wider way than Democrats do. So, and there are values that Democrats can run on. Common decency, the common good, uh, respect, tolerance, all of those same values, integrity, all those values. But in, before you get to somebody's head, and a 10-point policy plan, you've got to get to their gut. gut. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember you saying that in closed-door meetings. <laughs> um, talk about the book. 
Uh, I've read it. I know um, you did. I, I blurbed Thank it before you. you were a candidate for office, and we were going to sit here and just talk about the mixing of your um, sort of, not hard edges, but your, your, your sort of career in politics, and then sort of what I know to be a real passion of yours. Every time I saw you, you were reading a book about spirituality, or you're re you know, and, and so I've known this to be your passion, but this is the first thing you've written about it. It's the first time I've written about it in this way, and I, as I was saying to you earlier before we came on, I didn't write this book thinking I was going to be a candidate in the midst of this cruelty that exists in our politics in all of this. But as I reflected afterwards, it's a book basically about in this time of troubled time and disruption, and it seems to be in large amounts of hate and meanness. How can we find our center and how can we find what matters to us? And I think all of us through COVID, through a global you know, meltdown, uh, through climate change, the fascinating thing to me is all of the, dem the demonstration of these issues, Nicole, show how connected we are, but our politics is, is, has been com completely disconnected. Mm -hmm. So at a time when the globe now inf inf affects all of us in so many different ways, the only way to respond to that is to try to become more connected to it. And I think I would ask everybody, and I know this is you, is to sit back, take some moments of quiet, take some moments of time, and really figure out what your heart and your soul is calling and calling you to do and how you can be of service. All of us can do something. It doesn't mean running for office. It doesn't mean sitting in the anchor chair. It could be anything. It could be helping a soup kitchen. It could be treating somebody nice at the grocery store. We all have a way for our own our own stone in the pond to ripple across and, and do this, I don't think it's going to ever be fixed top down. It's only going to be fixed by us and the changing our ways in our own lives. So I, I want to know what that looks like because I, I, you know, I'm not a good, um, you know, I have all the meditation apps on my phone and I get mad after two minutes. I can lay with my son and watch him fall asleep and breathe. And then two minutes later when he's snoring, I've got the phone up and I'm enraged again by something I see on Twitter. I mean, how do you keep the Zen? Well, you know, that's, that's actually a really good question because I've had to practice it now because I'm in the midst of this now, right? In a candidacy against one of the most incompetent, cruel people that I, you could run against, which is the lieutenant governor of Texas here, uh, and, and, and all of the stuff that comes at you in the midst of this. It is a constant practice, and we all have to have a practice of it to how to stay centered in it. But to me, the only way the goodness wins and the only way compassion wins and the only way decency wins is not by doing an ends justify the means. Republicans got the ends justify the means. They'll do anything totally. in that. For us to win and for Democrats to win and really take partisanship out of it for, for the good to, to succeed, which I believe love in the end conquers, but maybe not in the moment that it and right will be right over time, is to show a different way to do this. And you can be strong and you can, as you know, I'm, you can be compelling and you can speak out and you can say the truth, but you also can treat everybody decently as you do that and not to devolve into the Donald Trumpville or the where the Republicans are. They have that brand covered. Yes, and so do. trying to be out brand them on that, you're not going to win. So the best way to do it is to do the opposite of it.